Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, the most common fire safety issues during healthcare renovations. My name is Jennifer Crosby with Stark Systems and I will serve as your moderator. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be sent in a follow-up email to you. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will save time for questions at the end of the presentation. Now let me introduce you to our speakers. Josh Brackett, System Regulatory Director and Facility Operations for Banner Health and Co-Founder Chief Learning Officer with Legacy FM and Bruce Bickford, Vice President of Product Development with Stark Systems. Now I'd like to turn things over to our first speaker to get us started. Please go ahead, Josh. Thanks so much, Jen, and thanks everybody for uh, for being here. Really appreciate uh, this. As Jen mentioned, um, I am the System Regulatory Director for Banner Health, work in the uh, facilities uh, group and help and support design and construction and facilities operations, a big part of the you know, transition transitioned operations process. Uh, I'm also a, uh, I am a fire geek, uh, code geek. A lot of you may follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I love codes, uh, regulatory compliance. Um, so that is what we're here to talk about today. Specifically, you know, I wanted to, we wanted to dig into like five, like five common issues related to um, construction and, and fire safety, life safety issues. Um, the five that, that we're targeting today are uh, really the lack of knowledge and understanding around NFPA 241, uh, which is our standard for construction alteration and, de and demolition operations. And tied directly to that in correlation is a lack of knowledge, that lack of knowledge of NFPA 241 really does lead to a lack of enforcement. That doesn't, but that doesn't mean that it's not a required standard, right? So a required standard. Um, and we're also going to dive into a little bit about the competing uh, codes and standards, like how, how we have different codes and regulations um, that in different jurisdictions and how that leads often to confusion and how owners can help clean, clean and clear some of that up. We'll also touch on chapter 43 of NFPA 101. It's one of my favorite chapters. Uh, it's our building rehabilitation chapter. And then of course, we're gonna dive into UL listed criteria and how assemblies ha have to meet uh, UL listed um, specific speci specificities. Ah, there we go. So we are going to have code references in this document. So don't worry, I won't bore you. I'm not going to read the code to you. Uh, hopefully you guys will be excited from this and go read the code yourself. Uh, but we are going to dive into, uh, I'll summarize, we'll have some stories, things like that. Uh, and then of course, time at the end for Q&A. Um, so chapters 18 and 19, 18 is our new healthcare occupancy chapter, 19 is existing. 20 is new ambulatory, and 21 is existing ambulatory. All four of these chapters point us directly to uh, compliance with NFPA 241. It's one line in the code that is often missed, but it is a shall requirement. So let's dig into really what that looks like. So 241, let's, what is it? Right? So let's start there. What is 241 and why am I showing the 2009 edition? Well, we'll talk about that too. So 241 is our safeguard for, uh, for protection against uh, fires during construction, alterations, demolition, uh, and its goal, its purpose is to prevent or minimize fire damage during those operations, right? One thing that's important to note is that it's not healthcare specific. Uh, it is adopted by some jurisdictions, uh, separately outside of NFPA 101. So you have to be cognizant and careful. Um, even if it's not adopted, it is a best practice. So uh, we're following the 2009 edition because NFPA 101 2012 references the 2009 edition of code. Um, we follow the 2012 edition in healthcare specifically, which is you know my background and, and focus, uh, because CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, provides uh, or has adopted into federal law the 2012 edition of NFPA 101. So that's why we're referencing the 2009 edition. 
So let's dig into some of the, speci the specific requirements of 241. So 241 uh, pushes us back from a hot work perspective directly to NFPA 51B. And, and that's important because in NFPA 51B, this is where we get things such as our hot work permits and some of our fire watch requirements during hot work and where, where hot work is permitted in designated areas and non-permissible areas. So it's very important. Uh, it's, it's also interesting to see like how one code, how our, our chief code uh, 101 life safety code references something which references additional information. Sometimes you have to follow that lineage to figure out the requirements. 241 also says in when, when you have a means of egress uh, for construction, that the means of egress has to be in accordance back to NFPA 101 Life Safety Code. Right? So, and it says in there, only, only where required means of egress are required by fire protection features, they have to be continuously maintained, right? Or, you have to have, you have to implement alternative life safety measure, measures ALSMs, uh, which if you're Joint Commission um, or you're Joint Commission Hospital or you've heard of Joint Commission, you've probably heard it called ILSMs, interim life safety measures. Same thing, same terminology. But it is what it means is that when we reduce the level of life safety in the building below the requirements of the life safety code in FDA 101, we have to assess if uh, if alternative measures are necessary, and if so, we have to implement those measures. Just real quickly, I want to touch on this this picture here. This is a picture. This is a picture that actually uh, really changed the trajectory of codes uh, as we know it. Also changed uh, is, is one of the foundations of my history uh, and why I became a fire protection engineer. This is the uh, the Ash Building in New York City. Still stands today, but it is the location of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Uh, and the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire um, had a lot of means of egress issues uh, and several, uh, a lot of people died. Ultimately, this ended up leading to the creation of the Safety to Life Committee, which is still in existence today, and ultimately turned into the Life Safety Code in FPA 101. So means of egress is very, very, very important from a life safety perspective. Now, the next next section that we talk about is fire watch. In, in 241, it says you, that you have to have a fire watch uh, whenever you um, are doing construction. And this is where, you know, I get a lot of questions on, um, well, can fire the fire watch guy, can they do other stuff? Can it be my security guard? Can it be, can they have, you know, because I don't want to pay somebody just to sit and watch for fires. No, code says fire watch shall be assigned no other duties. This is a critical role. Uh, it's very important. I know we don't, take things necessarily as seriously sometimes, um, but it is very important. I'll give you an example here. So in that same section, it talks about that uh, when you're doing tor torched roof applications, uh, and then you have to do fire watch for two hours after. I know personally, firsthand of a hospital that had a fire uh, occur on uh, right after they were uh, applying a new roof, um, about an hour after application of the new roof, the fire started the fire department ended up making the hospital evacuate the building. Uh, that's a whole nother conversation for another day. But the fact is, is that this stuff does happen. There's a reason that this is in the code. There's a reason that uh, we have to, to follow it. It's not a, it's not a um, if it's going to happen, you have to treat it as a when it's going to happen. Standpipes, I'll harp on standpipes just a little bit. The biggest thing here is that when you're building a new building, when you're building an addition, when you have standpipes in the building, the standpipes have to be maintained and ready to be used at all times, okay? If, you're, if not, you've got to coordinate with the fire department. The whole point of the standpipe is, especially if you don't have an active sprinkler system, this is the line of defense, right? So the fire department has to know, be aware um, of, of, of the construction that's going on, where the standpipes are, where they're not active, uh, has to be very, very clearly marked and communicated. Um, was just reading a case study this weekend about a building in construction caught on fire, burnt to the ground. So because uh, and the, and standpipes would have that active standpipes would have prevented it. So this is something that happens currently too. 
Okay, now we kind of get to the crux of, of uh, one of the one of the key things, especially for healthcare: temporary wall separation. Uh, 241 requires that protection is provided when you have an occupied portion of the building. Well, in healthcare, we have it all the time. That's all we do, right? I mean, unless you're building a greenfield site, a new hospital, then you are doing construction um, in an, in adjacent to an occupied portion of the building. So there are two requirements associated with that. We'll go into that now. So there's, you can either do a one hour wall separating the, the occupied portion of the building from the, from the construction area, or you can do a non-rated wall, but you have to follow, uh, you have to have an approved automatic sprinkler system. This is not an option. I see this all the time. I was walking a construction site just last week where I was like, okay, where's my, where's our one hour barrier? Where's our one hour wall? We don't have it, right? So um, this is this is something that is very, very critical because uh, we have a higher combustible load during, in, in construction. We uh, have to provide that separation because it goes back to, everything ties back to, of course, the means of egress, right? It, when we have to evacuate, we're only evo evacuating a portion of the hospital, right? We don't we don't evacuate the whole hospital, so we use um, partial evacuation strategies, and this this buys us the time. This one hour wall or the sprinkler system. One important note that we wanted to bring up here is that construction tarps are not appropriate barriers. I know that this is in the annex. I know it's a shall not should, right? But or it's a should not shall. Let me say that the right way. It's a should not shall. However, it should it should be a shall. Boy, say that 10 times fast. So the reason for that is um, that construction tarps, not only from a fire protection perspective, uh, don't meet the uh, fire, the fire, um, the flame spread rating index or the smoke development index. They also are not appropriate ICRA barriers. Uh, so from an infection prevention side. So uh, very, very critical. I, I hate, personally, do not like construction tarps at all. Um, not a proponent. Okay, so let's look at um, a few examples here for the sprinkler system side. So one thing that's, uh, that's also often missed is that you can't just remove the ceiling and just leave the sprinklers in place. Uh, you, have to, you have to bring that sprinkler system, if it's an existing system, up to NFPA 13 in order for it to be an approved, as we just saw on the previous slide, an approved sprinkler, um, sprinkler system. So uh, let's look at actually these pictures there's some sprinklers in these pictures and there's a few important things here to note what this really means okay this is there's a couple of different options here you'll see obstructed construction okay which is which is where you actually have structural members uh below the deck but there's also unobstructed construction so if you have unobstructed construction your sprinkler heads have to be within 12 inches of the deck and uh throughout the entire coverage area the obstructed construction then you have to be six inches below structural members with a max of 22 inches below the deck so you've got to bring the sprinkler system up to code is really what i'm saying and you've got to look at some structural members are uh deeper than 22 inches which means that you now have bays in place and you've got to take the put put a line between the two and take it up to uh within 12 inches of the deck so there are implications here um, I, it's all, it's often though, you, I mean, you've got to look at the, each project. This is the big thing. Look at each project and determine what is the best thing for the patient. What's the best thing for the hospital? What is the easiest thing? Is it easier to take a firewall and extend it from, from floor to deck? Sometimes that's very hard in existing construction. Sometimes it's easier to do a sprinkler system, but take the time and do the research and figure out for each project which what makes the most sense so i did say i told you i was going to harp a little bit on on standby uh, and a big part of this is just a lot of uh, coordination needs to go uh, needs to be performed with the fire department the local fire department we are altering their knowledge of the building they are there to respond in the event of a fire it's very, very critical. So um, when when you when you are when your building has standpipes, make sure that they are always ready for department use. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, the sprinkler system has to remain in service. This is even during demolition. We're talking about demolition now. Even during the demolition side, your sprinkler system has to remain in service until the as long as there's a condition requiring it. 
that condition is the one hour barrier, the one hour, uh, the one hour fire barrier. It has to be an active sprinkler system and you've got, you may have to do phases. That's very important. You may have to say, okay, we'll do a one hour right now and then we'll phase, phase the sprinklers in uh, and then remove the one hour barrier or vice versa. So um, include that in the phasing process. Uh, one other thing, I just want to make note of this. You know, th there's been a lot of substantial changes. Uh, the committee's put a lot of care into this. I know a few of the committee members um, into the newer editions of NFPA 241. Although it's not adopted by uh, CMS yet, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider including aspects of it in your uh, in your project. Um, as owners, we can include best practices uh, and exceed the code. The codes are always in the scope of every single code. It says this is the minimum requirement. The minimum requirement does not necessarily mean that that's the best thing for this project, for the hospital, for the patients. So look at that. I implore you, please, please look at the newer editions and incorporate what your minimum requirements are going to be. So, and we go back to enforcement. So this picture is uh, is a picture I took recently actually at the ASHE PVC this year uh, down in New Orleans, a blocked exit. Sometimes we struggle to get the basic enforcements down, right? This is a this is baseline here. So, um, and that doesn't mean that it's not required. That doesn't mean that it's going to stand up in court if it ever does get to that point. So, please make sure that it, it, you are enforcing it as well. It doesn't have to be just because the fire marshal says it's okay does not make it the right thing to do. Uh, I've got an example there. Um, I actually had a smoke evacuation system where, and I still have the letter to this day where the fire marshal signed off that I could remove the beam detectors. And those were the only things that activated that smoke evacuation system in this atrium. Clearly not construction related, but the fire marshal told me it was okay. That doesn't make it, that, that, that doesn't make it okay though. <laughs> uh, also, I love to hear, um, well, NFPA 101 doesn't apply here. We follow IBC. Again, uh, I I follow NFPA 101-2012 because up to 80% of my funding comes from the federal government for Medicare Medicaid reimbursement. So it's kind of a big deal to me, right? So, um, and then of course, we've all heard, we've always done it this way. Let's look real quickly at the chapter 43 re rehabilitation. This is actually, I've, I've there are hour long presentations on chapter 43 alone. Uh, there's a great one out there actually by Jim Peterkin. I recommend you guys go go look it up. Uh, and there are um, six, six different classifications of building rehabilitation. We're not gonna get into each one of them, but I do wanna just point out that these have implications. Chapter 43 tells you when you have to meet the exit the any of the new chapters so chapter 18 for healthcare right it tells you if you have to bring an existing building or an existing system up to the new occupancy requirements or if you are permitted to to remain with the existing occupancy requirements a great example of this is number five change of user occupancy classification i just sent out an email on that this morning uh and you'll see a picture here of, of or lights um ORs are a great example. In older hospitals, we convert uh, the the worst OR uh, oftentimes to a storage room because we didn't have the storage that we needed. Well, because ORs are larger than 250 square feet, there's a there's a specific section in Chapter 43 that says in healthcare occupancies where you exceed the 250 square feet, you have to bring it up to the new um, the new chapter, new occupancy chapter requirements. What that means is for the new occupancy chapter in hazardous areas, it has to be sprinklered and you have to have a one hour barrier surrounding the room, right? So it's a very common citation um, by accrediting organizations. And uh, it's, it's something that if you're referencing chapter 43, then you'll catch it, but it is missed time and time again across the nation. So uh, again, please go read chapter 43 and, and do some more research. I've got a few, few uh, things we'll talk about here uh, from a definition perspective, just to, to level set. One thing, and I tie this back, this section here, really back to, to chapter four, which is a fundamental um, chapter. It's the general requirements chapter. Uh, so we talk up here about um, 
that when you when you have an existing building that exceeds the requirements of new occupancy chapter construction that you can bring that down to what the new uh, the new chapter requires okay so let's just say just an example that you have a two hour wall that was there for whatever reason built in the 70s and the new occupancy chapter says that only a one hour wall is required then you can derate that wall from two hours to one hour Existing, so this is where we tie back to that chapter four, and I, I am going to read this exactly. So existing life safety features that exceed the requirements for new buildings shall be permitted to be decreased to those required by new buildings. It's exactly what we just talked about. You can take existing features that exceed and bring them to the new building requirements. An example of this real quickly is um, is corridors uh, in, in, in prior to 1991, Corridors in healthcare had to be uh, one hour rated. After that, they only had to resist the passage of smoke. Well, if you haven't modified um, that building or you haven't changed the life safety drawings, you are permitted to do that so long as you are protected throughout with automatic sprinkler systems in accordance with NFPA 13. The opposite of this is also true. Existing life safety features that do not meet the requirements of new buildings, but exceed the requirements of the existing cannot be further diminished. Okay, so what we're saying here is that you can't, you cannot decrease the level of life safety if you don't meet the new occupancy chapter life safety requirements, you but you exceed the existing, you cannot decrease that any further. It's got to stay where it's at. Um, and an example of this is uh, if a if a um, uh, if a hospital has a six foot wide corridor. Uh, in it currently in an existing hospital, then you don't have, you cannot reduce that down any further. Uh, opposite though, if it, it has a 10 foot wide corridor, then you can reduce it to eight feet because eight feet is what the new occupancy chapter requires. So uh, very, very important, very important example. Even though existing says that you can go less than six feet, it doesn't mean that you can reduce it down any further than what it is because it was built at six feet. All right, last, last, last topic here. I just want to hit on this real quickly. Um, UL listed assemblies are critical. Understand what the assembly means, you, how UL tests assemblies. They test everything together. So here is an example. You know, we've got several several pictures here as examples, but it has very specific installation requirements. It has um, how how uh, the drywall, so let's just use a two hour wall, for example, two layers of, of sheetrock on each side, uh, and they have to, um, they have to, they cannot overlap. The seams cannot overlap. The screws have to be screwed into a certain depth, has to be specific. So one great example here is I was working in an existing hospital built in the 70s, not fully, uh, sprinklered. So I actually required a two hour barrier to be built between uh, occupied um, area and a construction area. And the uh, we, they, the contractor had um, somebody building the two hour wall on one side and somebody building the two hour wall on the opposite side and they were building two different two hour walls. Both were approved UL listed assemblies if built built in, uh, in uniformity. However, because they were building it different, it hadn't ever been tested that way. There was no proof that that was actually a, two, a two-hour barrier in you. So um, it's very important that you follow the installation requirements associated with UL listed assemblies. So I know we went through a lot. Uh, you guys will have access to this recording. I'd like to turn it over to Bruce um, to provide some really key information. Well, hey, Josh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, that was a very detailed presentation and uh, very informative. So I really appreciate that. Well, everybody, thanks for joining today. I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, just going through what, how Stark uh, has solved your containment problems when faced with fire and building code requirements. Stark was uh, founded by a healthcare contractor who felt there had to be a better way to do containment. And our name is an acronym which defines that, simple, telescopic, airtight, reusable containment. And since our founding, we've been a leader in temporary modular containment, and we're the only company that offers multiple containment solutions to fit your project needs. 
were relied on by top contractors and healthcare facilities around the country in all 50 states and in some foreign countries as well. And really, for since day one, customers have been asking us for a one-hour rated solution, and that's what we come up with today. Many of our customers are large national contractors and major medical systems, and they've all been expressing the need for a fire rated system that reduce their cost and project times to build these rated assemblies. The key challenges for us was to develop a truly reusable modular design that met all of the other features and capabilities that we're known for, like the lift and drop connections, the durability, ICRA compliance, great appearance and the like. And so to reach this goal, we spent a ton of time and money on developing a core technology that would meet the thermal and mechanical performance requirements and have done extensive fire testing in the process to get there. What we've come up with is a product that offers unmatched benefits when compared to tr traditional drywall. It's up to four times faster to install. That means no taping, mudding, sanding, or painting and less coordinating with the various trades, uh, plus it can be installed and removed during normal business hours. It has superior noise blocking uh, with an STC rating of 40, which means less disruption for patients, visitors, and staff. It's exceptionally stable and looks and feels like a real wall when it's installed. It's extremely durable and can be used job after job. Uh, in fact, a lot of our customers use our panel systems hundreds of times. Because it's reusable and so durable, it typically pays for itself after just three to five uses and then generates ongoing cost savings or revenue for the contractor. And finally, it looks great. Uh, it's part of what we do and it blends into the existing healthcare environment while hiding the disruption of renovation. The, all of our systems exceed ICRA and this wall specifically meets class five as well as the EASTM E84. So let's take a look and see how the system works. It's, uh, the system's been optimized to work with soffit or ceiling heights from eight feet to 10 feet. And we start with a perimeter telescoping floor, wall, and ceiling track system uh, that connects to the rated uh, walls or, or, or ceilings or soffits. These telescoping tracks have been engineered for maximum flexibility by both telescoping and incorporating our novel snip cut system which divides the track sections into shorter reusable lengths. And by design, the tracks allow up to six inches of gap in both width and height. So overall, we have an easy system to adapt to any floor plan or ceiling soffit height. Once the tracks are in place, the modular reusable panels float inside those tracks and use our lift and drop connection to go left and right. The panels come in six, 12 and 24 inch widths for size flexibility. We also have two corners, uh, angles 90 and 135 with the same lift and drop connection. Our door module then connects as well with the lift and drop and it's rated one hour uh, with a 3668 door. It has a four way pivot so we can go left, right, in or out. And finally, if you're for any negative air space, which is what we're famous for, uh, we have air discharge and monitoring panels uh, as well for this system. So you can create negative air spaces and measure that amount of uh, negative pressure. Let's take a quick look and see uh, how this goes. So the, the basic system, again, will start with uh, just marking out the floors I'm sorry, first we'll unpack, that's good. Um, we'll unpack the walls and, and then uh, we'll mark out the floors, walls and ceiling with a laser uh, center lines. We'll start mounting the ceiling base angle in place. And then on the floor reflecting below that, the, the base tracks and you can see those extensions snapping into place. And then finally the wall track uh, joins the ceiling track and the floor track. Again, any of our track sections can be snip cut. So we cut the edge with tin snips and flex and snap it apart. Then the panels get placed. Uh, again, lift and drop very simply. We use vacuum handles to move them around. And then the doors, uh, door module can be placed and then the final accessories. To insulate around the panels uh, against the wall or up at the top, we use fire block pillows, which are our product. And then you put the covers on, on the tracks and that's it. So really straightforward process to uh, build that assembly. Very fast and with no training required. Here's a couple of examples of some assemblies. 
both are constructed to a soffit and were assembled in a matter of hours with a small crew without prior training. These walls are put up during normal hours, so don't require overtime or off-shift work to install or remove, and no secondary containment was needed for the installation, as you would, of course, need with uh, drywall. You can also use our light barrier and real wall panels in conjunction with fire block if you want to build anti-rooms or additional isolation, isolation uh, that doesn't require the one-hour fire barrier rating. So again, our systems all work together. For FireBlock, uh, we've worked closely with Intertech for testing and our listings uh, against towards the uh, principal E119 and E84 Class A certifications. And we have a separate certification for the UL10C one-hour rated door frame. And then we use a commercial one-hour door to go with that. We've also been working closely with regulators in Kansas and California to gain their approvals. California's healthcare regulatory body, uh, known as HCI, uh, or used to be OSHPOD, uh, has approved our system for both a seismic and fire life safety standpoint. As well, the California State Fire Marshal has now recognized our system and approved it with a listing in their, build to, in their building materials index. California regulators are extremely tough and uh, we've worked very hard to satisfy them that fire block wall meets all of their requirements. In return, they're very excited uh, to see the, our system being adopted widely within the state to simplify and uh, really, really bring fire code compliance uh, into more situations. So for healthcare settings, fire block wall checks all the boxes uh, in meeting NFPA 101 and therefore 241. Uh, IBC, NFPA, and ICRA standards in creating the one hour fire barrier wall system. And just to show you, uh, typically to meet NFPA 241 standards or certainly the uh, E119 standard, a rated firewall must be constructed up against an equivalent one hour rated assembly, which is typically in this case, a hard soffit uh, from floor to the deck above. Nominally, to meet this requirement with our system, the customer would build this soffit down from the deck to the ceiling plane. Uh, then our system is installed under the hard soffit uh, to create the fire rated assembly. Alternatively, a supported shaft wall lid assembly can be constructed under the ceiling from the rated wall out, and our system could be installed underneath that lid. Next. In many jurisdictions, you know, we've heard about this and everybody does things a little differently as Josh alluded to, you know, in term, certain uh, IHJs uh, or code officials may say they will allow um, a fire partition separation without going to the deck. And so again, based on customer input and, and requests from customers, uh, we've specifically designed this system to mount to uh, an acoustical tile grid. Uh, and be re reinforced back to the structure with kickers or braces uh, to carry the loads. In these cases, fire block wall acts as a fire partition and the approval may require uh, a smoke barrier above, you know, with plastic film uh, and or sprinkler coverage uh, for, uh, as Josh mentioned, and to be uh, above the ceiling uh, to protect the space. These are all really handled on a case-by-case -case basis and up to the ILSM plan or ALSM plan, the fire life safety officer, a code official or other AHJ to really consider what options are permissible. And a lot is really determined by what kind of spaces are being protected. Um, an equipment storage closet, as he mentioned, will require a one hour fire barrier, whereas the change of use space to something less hazardous may allow a partition to be used. So it's really up to your AHJ to determine what can be done. But uh, again, our system is flexible and can be uh, used in this way. Next. So again, as Josh cited, um, talking about the sprinkler coverage, um, you know, what we can do is put up a non-rated wall, like in this example, uh, our sprinkler coverage would be provided on both sides of a real wall installation, or one of our flagship products, uh, by turning up the heads or adding heads up against the deck in the construction area. These real wall panels are non-rated, but they're non-combustible with the benefits of having E84 performance, dustless installation, they're great looking, sound attenuating, and none of the maintenance associated with plastic sheeting. 
And we've learned uh, the holy grail in temporary containment, you know, when we're out talking to customers, uh, is the fact to stay below the ceiling while providing that one hour rated barrier. So we've developed a system which is really our number one request, uh, which is to put a cap on our walls, on our fire block walls, allowing fast, dustless, and quiet creation of a fire containment along a rated wall. When you add a door and negative air capability, these walls can serve as a rated anteroom or working space, uh, uh, certainly so that you can penetrate the adjacent wall uh, during the process. With the speed these assemblies can be installed and removed, you can save weeks of time in your phasing plans Work, or work during normal hours in a busy facility with one trade and have no demolition waste from the containment. So there's a lot of benefits. We expect to be delivering this product in the, this year in early Q4 in volume. So I hope that we've showed you how we can enhance your ability to be more compliant with fire and life safety codes while saving money and time on your renovation projects. The Stark family of wall systems all work together and we can easily mix and match up our three product lines for the most cost-effective and capable containment solutions available today. So I will now turn this over to Jen. Thank you, Josh and Bruce. Um, so we'll go ahead and take some time for questions now. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. Um, and it does look like we've had a number of questions that have come in. So. See, there's Josh, Bruce. So um, Josh, first question is for you. Um, since you are referencing the 2009 edition of NFPA 241, would we also follow the older edition of, of NFPA 51B? Uh, so yes, I believe, um, I, can't, I don't think that NFPA 101 uh, has a direct reference to NFPA 51B. I literally have it pulled up right now. So let's check. It does not. So yes, you do follow, you would have to follow the um, edition referenced in NFPA 241. Great. Another question for you, Josh. Uh, regarding Firewatch, is the requirement that Firewatch shall have no other duties specific only to hot work or does it apply to systems out of service as well? It applies to systems out of service as well. Okay, this is a long one. Oh. <laughs> Tina, I'm gonna to try to do your question justice. Um, can you please explain initiates a fire watch with a fire alarm system is out of service more than four out of 24 hours or when sprinkler system is out of service more than 10 hours in a 24 hour period? Is fire watch required for planned unplanned if the impairment is less than the, the four hours fire alarm or 10 hour sprinkler. Oh, okay, I'm following, I, I understand. Okay. Um, so no, if you are under the four hours or the 10 hours uh, and your systems are out of service, either fire alarm for four hours, sprinkler for 10 hours, then no, a fire watch is not required. However, um, it is something that uh, should be still considered depending on what you are doing. Uh, so example, like hot work, then yes, it would be required. Um, so. Uh, it depends on what you're doing, and you also need to have a plan in place uh, in case you are doing work, let's say, on the sprinkler system. They say it's only going to take two hours. It never takes only two hours. Um, so make sure that you have a contingency plan in place for that. Great. Thanks, Tina. Tina said good job. So I did her question justice. Thank you, yes. Tina. Um, did I answer it, Tina? You can reply <laughs> on that too. Uh, Tina, just confirm if, if Josh has answered that for you or if, um, yes, she, you answered it. Um, awesome. Josh, does NFPA 241 require, to, require you to relocate sprinklers when the ceiling tiles have been removed as part of the construction? Will yes. sprinklers be able to collect enough heat to activate if the ceiling tiles have been removed? You have to, that's where we go back to, you have to bring the sprinkler system up to NFPA 13 requirements, which is where we were talking about it has to be within so many inches of the deck or the uh, beams or pockets of, of those structural members. Uh, so it, it does require that you move the sprinkler heads um, up to the deck. If you leave them down at the bottom where the, where the ceiling was, let's say it's a drop ceiling, acoustical tile ceiling, if you leave it down there where it was, no, you will not be in compliance with 13 and you will have to have a one hour wall. 
Great, uh, Bruce, a couple questions for you. Can I use the cap to make a four foot deep space? Yeah, uh, not currently. And we did that mainly uh, because of customer input. Again, trying to maintain a six foot passageway in the halls um, and the principal use that we've heard of uh, is to you know go down the hallway with a long run of wall. So we've kept that pat panel width right now at two feet deep. Uh, so it could be as long as you need to go down, but right now it's the, the initial product will only allow a two foot depth. Great, and can your system be installed to the deck? We cannot. Uh, again, we're, we're limited to a 10 foot height. So obviously in a lot of situations, not only is the deck farther than that, but of course uh, we have all the stuff that's above the ceiling. Uh, so going through all the penetrations that be necessary would be uh, really complicated with our system. So it's uh, sim simply uh, easier just to stay below a soffit and have uh, that soffit construction uh, be above in the uh, above the ceiling. Another question for you, Bruce. Um, can I build a shaft wall lid and put your walls underneath? Yes, uh, we're working with our engineers uh, to come up with a system that would allow, uh, until our cap product comes out, uh, a means of building a uh, UL263 shaft wall lid uh, that's self-supporting and then our wall system would conventionally install underneath it. And part of the system design there would be that this whole system would be prefabricated and not have to be built on site, but it could be prefabricated and carried in and assembled as a unit. Great, a um, couple more questions for you, Josh. Um, what do you personally like to see on active construction projects? Oh, that's a good one. So I, I personally like that, you're talking to a fire protection engineer, right? Yeah, I say, Personally, if we can have sprinklers, do sprinklers uh, because a sprinkler system is built to contain that, especially if I'm looking in healthcare and I've got occupants there um, that are adjacent to it, uh, then I really try to do uh, active sprinkler systems. I also really, even though we didn't talk about fire alarm, um, it it's I hear a lot of the time it's a cop out of, um, well, we're just gonna have uh, false alarms with smoke detectors and things like that. It's not the case. It can be managed correctly. It can be managed properly to prevent false alarms um, from, from smoke detectors. So smoke, remember smoke detectors, uh, heat detectors are your initial immediate um, first line of defense from a fire protection perspective. When you're talking the entire ecosystem of life safety, that smoke detector or heat detector is the very first line of defense. Um, and it can it can be managed, so that's that's very important. I, I always think about not like when we have 40, 40 construction workers there on the project. I think about when we're on third shift and I have one plant operator there, and that's it, right? So um, I want that first line of defense, and I want that that security. Uh, but um, I have, like I said, I've I've required on construction projects just depending. Uh, uh, on what it is above and beyond the code, for example, that two hour wall I was talking about. So uh, it just depends on the application, but that's kind of, I could probably talk about that for a whole hour. <laughs> uh, do uh, another question is coming, uh, do, do sprinkler heads need turned up if ceiling tiles are out for less than 10 hours? When tiles are out for, no, no, because your system is not impaired for more than the 10 hour period. Paul, feel free to follow up if, if, if that was not asked correctly. We can clarify. Um, another question for you, Josh. Um, I noticed you didn't discuss fire alarm systems in construction areas. What are your thoughts and do you have any recommendations? Oh yeah, so that's what we were just talking about. Yes, so um, I absolutely do think that fire alarm systems should remain active during construction projects. And I know that's um, not a popular opinion, uh, but I've just seen, I have personally been a part of four fires in hospitals. Um, so believe it or not, they happen. You just don't hear about them. Uh, so they do still happen. Um, never has anybody died, never has anybody been, been injured, thankfully, luckily, but they do occur. Um, so that's something, one of them did occur um, in a construction project. So uh, it's something that happens. And again, I want that first line of defense. Um, I want to be notified uh, as quickly as possible, because that is the, the, the time is the fastest and easiest way to mitigate 
the spread of fire and smoke throughout the building. I always think about the smoke more than I think about the fire because more than 80% of people that are in fires die from smoke inhalation and uh, asphyxiation and not actual fire heat flames. And it's interesting to that because a question just came in, do sprinkler heads provide limiting for smoke spread? No, uh, so uh, yes and no. I mean, it, it, it uh, mitigates the spread of the fire, right? So, and, and once you do that, then um, you are limiting the the smoke however it's not it that's not its intent that's not what it that's not what it does its job actually sprinkler systems aren't designed to extinguish fires either uh, if you actually go to nfpa 13 it talks about containing it's about containing the fire and preventing the spread of the fire um, they are not almost always almost every single time it's going to extinguish the fire but that's not its job and I have one one final question um, that has come in, and that's, does adding a one-hour wall or having a compliant sprinkler, sprinkler system cost more, and, and what if the owner doesn't want to pay that extra cost? Oh, gosh, yes. So, uh, yes, it does. It does cost money, um, and uh, it becomes very difficult, right, when you're, when you're dealing with owners that don't necessarily either don't understand the code or that are on that um, it's not going to happen to me train, right? So, uh, and it's very easy for us to forget um, that things do happen. Nobody ever thought the Triangle Shirtwaist fire or the Coconut Grove fire or all these other fires, right? I mean, the Notre Dame fire were going to happen, uh, but they do happen. Um, and when they do, then there is legal prosecution uh, involved with those, right? So, um, and it does come back um, a lot of times to owners as well for either knowing or um, or uh, documenting it. So uh, what I would recommend from a contractor perspective is if the owner will not do it, then document it um, and tell them hey, it's a requirement. Um, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, this is a requirement. I document it and I cover yourself. Uh, and I would say to that owner, I don't, I mean, I'll reserve what I would say to that owner. <laughs> <laughs> and I did have one final question come in. Tina, you're going to wrap it up for us. Um, Josh, during construction, um, your opinion, if I have an existing FA system but remove 10 smoke detectors but replace with 10 heat detectors, are the 10 heats considered a temporary system? Um, yeah, so, oh gosh, is it a temporary system? Um, no, if it's tied to your existing fire alarm system, I would say no, um, because you're, it, 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 you are permitted in NFPA 72 to use heat detectors in lieu of smoke detectors where um, the environment is not suitable for smoke detectors. So what I would do is document that it would be significant dust um, and that you are using the option to use heat detectors in lieu of smokes. However, uh, I would also caution you on that uh, because, like I said, smoke detectors can um, can can be managed properly in construction environments by covering them up during the day when you do have people there and vacuuming, dusting them off before you put them back in service again. So that's something. And then also understand how heat detectors work. Uh, if you do install heat detectors, please install combination fixed temperature heat detectors with rate of rise. So rate of rise means that um, over a certain amount of time, if the temperature rises above uh, a certain number of degrees within that period, typically about 15 degrees within a five minute period, then it will activate. So it's a more proactive approach um, using a, a combination fixed temp heat of, uh, rate of rise heat detector. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone for submitting so many great questions. I'd like to give a big thank you again to our speakers, Josh and Bruce. Um, a recording from today's webinar will be available soon. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We appreciate you being here and we hope you have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.